All right, brilliant. Welcome everybody to the 11th Power BI for Government Community of Practice. So glad that you could join us today for our session. A little bit of housekeeping before we do kick off. Uh, this is a Teams webinar. Um, so thank you for registering. Um, and obviously for moving forward, you do have to register for each event, which is a little bit annoying. Um, but you can ask your questions today. We are going to have a Q&A session as well, so I would encourage you to ask your questions. Uh, you can drop them in the chat. You can raise your hand if you'd like to verbally ask your question. Uh, but just to note that this session is being recorded. So if you don't um, want your face shown, please turn your camera off. Uh, but I will record this session and I'll put it up on Datatel's YouTube channel so that anyone that's uh, missed the session can come back and watch that. For any of you who this is your first community of practice, welcome. Uh, this community of practice is all about connecting with other people within government who are users of Power BI. So what we do here is we let users tell their stories. So we're going to have real world examples. Uh, collaboration is something that I would love to get going. It's been a little bit difficult. Um, I do have a little bit of a talk at the end of today's session about possible way that we could collaborate with, with open data. Um, there's always learning opportunities, so best practice and tips. And as you know, Power BI is ever updating, um, so keeping you up to date with the latest updates in Power BI. Uh, just a reminder that there is a LinkedIn group. Um, I'll just bring it across here. Um, so there's a LinkedIn group. If you haven't joined the LinkedIn group, uh, it does have the, the Rego link. So if you do forget about the events, you can come and join us there. And there's always um, I drop in job opportunities in the government space. So you can see uh, data analyst position, city of Newcastle, uh, we've got CFA, et cetera. If you do have any jobs coming up, please drop them in there. I'll drop the link in there if you haven't joined already, um, but like just a place where you can keep up to date. Oh, where's my chat gone? Teams chat. There you are. I'll drop that in there if you're not in that group. Please do join us on LinkedIn. Uh, for those I haven't met, uh, my name is Warren Dean, founder of Datatail. Um, so I provide Power BI training, report development, best practice rolling out Power BI across your organization. So if you do need help with that, please do yell out. Um, I am trying to organize another Power BI training for government. So this is the one day course. I need to update this flyer. Over 600 people have attended this particular course. Um, and I do have two people interested. I'm looking for a few more. So if you are keen to the one day kind of end to end Power BI training, do shoot me an email. See if we can get a session up and running in December. Um, and also another thing I do want to mention is I have created a Power BI viewer course. So for those of you who are running you know, Power BI Enterprise, and we'll be talking about that a little bit today in terms of how you run Power BI, Power BI Enterprise. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I do have an online course that you can, I'm going to put it on YouTube. You can also get the LMS course and put it on there for me. Sorry, getting a bit of feedback. Um, so um, I'll put this on YouTube. I will send out a link so you can link to it on YouTube. If you'd like a copy of this to put in your internal LMS system, let me know. Um, I'll show you what it does look like. Uh, it does look like this. And it's all about how to navigate an app. So if you have a look, um, you know, it's what's Power BI. How do you navigate an app? How do you use the filter pane? How do you interact with charts? How do you use bookmarks? So it's only 10 minutes long, uh, but if you are creating a Power BI reports, you want to make sure that your users are able to use the Power BI report. So I'll send you the link for that in YouTube, but if you do want to put it in your internal LMS, shoot me an email um, and I'll, I'll get you a copy of that as well. So that's the Power BI online viewer course. Uh, and I do have a free book to give away. So Extending Power BI with Python and R has been given to me. Um, so this is for someone in the group. Please only if you're in Australia because I can't afford the postage. If you are not, um, I will drop the link in the chat for you. Um, so if you would like a copy of that book, I need more screens. There's all my screens got in here. All right, drop that over there. Copy of the URL is here. If you'd like a copy of that book, just pop your name in the chat. Um, if you're in Australia, 
and I'll post that one out to you. I'll pick a random winner at the end of today's session. So extending Power BI with Python and R. And you don't have to use Python and R before. Um, it does help you learn Python and R as well. All right, so for today's session, which is actually from 12 to 1 AEDT time. Um, so thank you to, to Raymond stepped up. So we had a late cancellation. So Raymond stepped up and he's going to be presenting on how do we scale up in terms of, you know, as you or a couple of people writing Power BI reports, how do we scale to organize organization wide reporting? Um, and we also have Tori from Stonington. She's going to be sharing an economic snapshot report that she has built for us. And at the end of the session, I'm going to share, um, well, it's not so much a council livability report, but more of an open data report um, that I'd like to be able to collaborate with you all and build together. So that'll be my session at the end. But what we're going to do first is we are going to jump in. Oh, sorry. Next session, um, I'll drop this one link. So please do register for our session in February. Um, so Brendan, who unfortunately wasn't able to present today, is going to be presenting on paginated reports. If you haven't heard about them, they are another option for you in the world of Power BI. He'll talk through how you can use paginated reports, when to use power paginated reports. And Raymond's uh, kindly offered to come back, and he's going to be talking about an open data platform that they have, which is very cool. And you can see how uh, they are opening up data within Power BI and sharing that out to the public. Um, so I've dropped that link in there for you. So please do register for that session in February. All right, so there's a lot of updates happening in the world of Power BI. So let's jump right in to Power BI. So hopefully you've got your November update um, if you're on um, standard Power BI. We have a new card reference label. Um, so if you have a look at the image there, so we had cards, but now we have reference labels in cards. Uh, and if I zoom in, uh, this is a reference labels and cards. So now you can have your card with your image, but you can also have multiple um, measures or columns underneath that as well. Uh, if I jump in just to give you a little bit of a demo, uh, jump into here. Um, so here, this is on the, the latest version of Power BI Desktop. You can see this whole, this is just one visual. Um, so if I have a look, You'll see this new card visual here. You can see there's multiple measures and columns in here. And if I go into the settings, what we have now is this one here that's called reference labels. So I'll show you one. I need to pick one of the cards, so not the title, because that's a little bit boring. I'll go to Revenue Open, and you can see I can now add a reference label. So this one already has Actually, let me go to one that's a bit closer. When I zoom in, revenue lost. So this one has one, two, and that's your one, two here. We can go and add another one. So I'll go into add a random measure in here. And you can see here the value has been added in. So the name is 1.3.2, which I could rename something a little bit better. Uh, but now, obviously, multi-card experience. We can have multiple reference labels. Um, and then even within a reference label, I think you can add additional details. So you can see here within a line, I can add more data to that one there. And if I pull a measure in there, I think that'll work. Pick one, 1.3. Just try to get that one in there. So reference labels and a reference label itself can have additional detail. So a lot of customization available in this particular visual. Jump back in my PowerPoint. So that's reference labels within cards. Just note that the roadmap, there's a lot more things coming. Um, we're also going to have actions. So if you haven't used actions, you'll be able to click on the card and possibly take you somewhere, which is going to be very cool. Trends, so trend lines, small multiples. So a lot of good work happening by that team um, in terms of how they're improving the card. And another one that they've brought out as well is the button slicer. Um, this is really cool because the button slicer, um, I always wanted to be able to use a toggle button. I was, you know, I had to use bookmarks. Um, we want to kind of stick away from bookmarks. Let me show you what that looks like now. Um, if, it, if you want a copy of this file, 
Um, I'll put it in the email when I wrap up to give you a link to the recording so that you can have a play with this as well. Um, so on the side on the right here, um, I have the, if I click on it, the new slicer. Um, and the new slicer allows images. Um, it also, I can have multiple lines, so I can have the name and the email in here. So it allows a tooltip. Um, it allows you to have, let me just jump in here in terms of the call out values. Um, if you've used these before, um, you can have a state. So in terms of when I hover, when I press, when I select it. So this is my selected one. I want the color to be um, full color, not gray, and I want it to be highlighted in blue. So um, a lot of options there. And if I show you on the next page here, not this one, where is it? Examples. Um, now we can do things like, you know, when I hover, the image will fade or blur a little bit. Um, you can see over here without, I'm not holding control because it's not, not bookmarks. I can turn on and off like a toggle button and make that have an action, which will be coming later. Um, and also within here as well. And check boxes, which I, which I just used yesterday. This is handy. You now, if you want to know, people can clearly see what's selected. You can have a check box in there, which is, that's just an image. And the image turns on or off when I'm selecting it. Um, tool tips are available as well. So definitely we'll be using that one. Uh, another change, if you haven't seen, is data sets are now called semantic models. You might have been surprised when you logged into Power BI and saw this new term, semantic model. Um, if you're not sure what a semantic model is and how it's different to a data set, uh, it isn't different. It's just a naming term that makes a little bit more sense. Um, I've linked here to a blog um, at tabulareditor.com. Um, we gave this really nice diagram here in terms of What's what's a semantic model um, in terms of a, a naming convention? And obviously for me as a train, it's a little bit more easier to complain, explain than a, you know, a data set. It's not just a set of data. A semantic model is data that has meaning to a person or organization. So you can see a product code or a quantity that has meaning to someone in the organization. And then the model itself is the objects or the calculations that represent a real world process. So that could be a measure. Uh, that could be the relationships in the data model. Um, so it's not just a set of data. That data has meaning and that data has measures, tables, relationships, etc. Um, so a bit of a name change, which leans us onto our next change, which is that we have a model explorer. Um, so if you've seen this within Power BI, I think this one came out last month, we do have a model explorer. And there it does show you that a model is more than just data. We have calculation groups measures, relationships, roles, tables, etc. Um, and one of those things that we do have, which I do want to demo quickly for you, is a calculation group. Uh, calculation groups aren't new, but for those of us just using Power BI Desktop, it is new. Um, so let me demo a calculation group for you, and I'll show you how that works. So here I have a, a calculation group. I have different time intelligence measures, um, and I want the end user to be able to select you know, I want to just see month to date, um, year to date, and uh, or hold control previous year. So they can select the measures they want to use. And I want to be able to reuse these measures with not just one. So you can see here, I'm using this sales amount, but I could bring in another amount as well. Um, and then they can have a look and view the data like that. Now to set this up, you need to go into your model view. In the model view, you'll see when you're in the model view here, calculation groups, you can create a new calculation group. Uh, this one I've called show as, and I have all these different calculation items. Let me quickly add a new one so I can show you how to do it. Um, I've got a year on year percentage in here, so I can right click on calculation items and say new calculation item. So you can see. Drop in my DAX. Um, so I've got a year on year percentage. So I'm dividing um, year on year by previous year. And I click commit. Um, and it'll add the new measure in here. Uh, I can also, because this one is a percentage and my other ones are decimals, I can have a dynamic format string here. Um, and so if I edit that, I'll just bring in the format that I want. 
it's a percentage. That. Um, and then I can I can change the order, so I could move year on year up. But this is the order that I would like. If I head back now to my report, uh, you can see there I have year on year percentage as well. And if I add year on year percentage, it comes up as a percentage type, when my other ones come up as decimal. So we can have different formats, different types. And I've I've already started using this with the client. It's quite handy. Uh, because they want, you know, I only want to see last year. I want to see last month. I want to see this month. Um, I can build that into a calculation group, um, and then I can just add the. Oh, sorry, this one here. So I'm cut the data by month. This is the value show as, but then it's going to perform the time intelligence on whatever measure I drop in the values here. So that's uh, calculation groups. Very handy if people want to see things by. For example, different times. So previous year, this year, last month, this month, this quarter. Um, instead of creating ten measures every time, we create a group of measures, and then you can call that group of measures. DAX query view. Um, let me demo this one for you as well. This one you do need to turn on. Jump over here. Um, you can see I have it turned on in the preview settings. The DAX query in here. Have a look at this. Um, this is really handy. You do need to, I suppose, be pretty good with DAX to be able to use this. But if you are a more advanced DAX user, you can jump into DAX in here and debug it and build your DAX codes in here. So if I if I create a new query, um, if I have a look in here and I want to edit a measure, there's a measure. I've got a measure sales amount. I can right click on the measure. If we have a look in here. I have four options that I can do. I can evaluate the measure and that gives me the value. So I'll demo that one first. I can evaluate. And it gives me, so they all need to have evaluate at the start, but it summarizes the columns and it gives me the value down the bottom. Um, now, if I actually want to edit that measure, I can right click new queries and I will define and evaluate. So define will give me how the measure has been created. So I can have a look in here and I can go sales order equals some sales amount. Um, I can I can edit it in here. So I could go, let's have a look at, I'll add a class in here, product class, and run it. Um, and then that will aggregate it down here for me. Uh, and then I could do something like times two. Oops, not times times sign, not x2. Sure. Um, and then when I run this, these numbers should double. So I can enter, edit my code in here. So this is similar if you've used DAX Studio or Tablet Editor. I know many of you in government organizations, you can't use external tools. So it's good to see this is coming directly in Power BI Desktop. Um, and the important thing here is we can actually update the model. So I can play around in here. I can work around with the measure. Once I get the value that I want, I can update the model. Can't be undone. And it will go and change this one to times two. And go back into my report now. And I can have a look in here. Have a look at wherever the measure is, sales amount. And you can see I've updated the measure from the DAX query view. So this is only its first release. It's still in preview. I'm sure they're going to improve it as it goes. But for those of you who have to debug your DAX, I think this is going to be a very handy tool for you. All right, last one. There's a lot of updates today. I wanted to show you explore your data. So let me drag over Power BI Desktop. While I'm in here, you can see um, I'm in a workspace called Test. All of your data sets now have explore this data preview. So I can, um, let me do it, maybe a simpler one, explore this data. Um, it'll open up a box and you'll see the tables in here and I can select country by sales. So no, I don't have to go into the report. I can see the columns, I can see the measures. Um, it even builds me a visual in terms of what I'm doing. Um, so it's a quick way to quickly explore that data and that particular, I was going to say data set, but it's now semantic model. So in the semantic model, um, and then I can even save this. 
and uh, I'm gonna put it in my workspace. Um, this is called explore. Um, and I can keep it, oh, it already exists. Okay, should have called something else. Save. Hey, 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 hey. And you can head over to your workspace. And if I look for that one that I called AAA, um, you can see here there's a new icon for it. So that's exploration. Um, it'll save your exploration, and I can click on that. Um, so a quick way to have a look at a semantic model, understand um, the tables, the measures. You can play with it as well, um, and you can bring it all out and look at it in there. So another one that is in preview, uh, explore this data. Oh, sorry, it was one more. So this one is not out yet, but I did want to make note of this. Um, for those of you who write DAX, you know that we have calculated columns and measures. We should never create calculated columns, measures, or how, what we should be creating in DAX. Um, but for those of you who find DAX difficult, I think this is coming out in March next year, we'll have something called visual calculations. So we can now create a DAX formula within a particular visual. Um, and I watched a presentation on this and I did take a screenshot. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry. Um, but what this means is instead of understanding, I suppose, the, the semantic model and the filtering that's happening on the semantic model, we can just look at one particular visual here. And I can say, in this visual, I want to know what the profit is. And then can you tell me the profit from, from the one that's above? Um, and so what it does, uh, there's, there's a previous DAX, so there's new DAX functions coming out. So I can say, you know, I'm interested in this blue, and then I'm interested in the one above, and I want you to put it on the same area here, the same row. Um, so this is, a, I suppose, I'll just put up here as a space to watch, um, but we're going to have a new type of calculation, which is called a visual calculation. Uh, it will only work for one visual, um, and it'll be easier to use because you just visually look at it and you get it to work how you want it to work in the visual instead of understanding the semantic model. So I want to look out for in, I think, March next year. All right, um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to hand over to Tori. Um, Tori is going to share about an economic snapshot report that she's built. So thanks, Tori, if you want to take over the screen for us. Okay. Oh, why is it nothing works? All right. <laughs> so the city of Stonington is a local government within the metropolitan area of Melbourne. We comprise of nine inner southeastern suburbs between three and 13 kilometres from the CBD. So basically we go from Punt Road all the way through to Chadston. I have 25 years in IT, mostly in an IBM mainframe application development, um, and I have a master's in data science. I'm a senior data analyst in the data enablement team, and I've been at COS for two and a half years. We have just completed building a data stack in AWS, which retrieves data from our internal source systems and some external data sources for reporting. My role is to wrangle data and produce reports to help the business make decisions, and I also run the monthly Power BI community of practice for staff. So this presentation, we're going to look at the economic snapshot that we produced for the economic and place development team. So the economic and place development team's aim was to produce quarterly snapshots as a regular way of reporting to businesses, business associations, councillors and the public about how well our shopping precincts are doing. Ultimately, we plan on having them on the website so that um, anyone can download them and help them understand where there may be areas of opportunity. So they basically fulfill three requirements, reporting for communicating trends to councillors and helping us to identify impacts on our place-led economic development strategy, planning to draw insights to help tailor activations to specific precincts and target according to need, and insights for businesses and business associations to better understand what is happening in their activity centres. 
So we started off with a long list of data requirements for an annual activity report by precinct. And these included um, profiles, so on people, they wanted population, expected population growth, age, unemployment rate, percentage of renters, homeowners, mortgages. And then for income, what the medium weekly household income is, the individual weekly income percentage over the minimum weekly wage. For average retail rent tenancy, the average rental per annum, square metre of lettable area. And then for economic activity, the number of businesses, our engagement with businesses, community concierge statistics, businesses that are open after 6 p.m., our vacancy rates, businesses by industry, um, expenditure, nighttime expenditure, foot traffic, and then for modes of transport, percentage of public transport, active transport, percentage of people using cars, and percentage of people working from home. So as you can imagine, this was a big, long laundry list. And we made the decision to just start with economic activity. So we have foot traffic from our IoT sensors, which we have on the AlphaX platform run by Minnovation Technologies. Our vacancy data comes from vacancy audits conducted by E3. And we get our spend map data from spend map by Geographica. And our business concierge data was uh, manually being maintained in spreadsheets, and we later dropped that from scope. So our main shopping precincts are Glen Ferry Road in Malvern, High Street in Armadale, Paran, South Yarra, Turek Village, Windsor and Hawksburn Village. So some of the challenges were we had different time frames for our data collection. Our, tra our foot traffic we get hourly via an API. Our vacancy data we're just doing in January and August, and that's imported to a database and then uploaded. And we get spend data CSV files sent monthly around about the 15th of the month. And of course, we have different levels of granularity. Our spend data is only by suburb. Our vacancy data we can do at a suburb or a precinct level. And of course, because we have the latitude, longitude coordinates of our sensors, they're a lot easier to locate. Um, some of our precincts can be in more than one suburb. So here we have the Hawksburn Village. This side of Malvern Road is Paran. This side is South Yarra and this side is Turak. And at the moment, we don't have IoT sensors located at all our precincts. Another challenge was the business hadn't done anything like this before. It had previously been outsourced. So we went through quite a few iterations, and, and these are the main ones. So we started off with this fairly garish um, PDF. Then they said, well, can we have it colour schemed by, um, by shopping area? So we, we changed it to that. Then they fiddled around with it. Um, then they cleaned it up a bit, and then they sent this version out to people that hadn't been involved in the um, project and said, what do you think? And the feeling came back and said, why aren't you using our colour scheme from the pledge strategy? So two days before we were due to launch this, we went with this model. So this is how it works. We have the AlphaX platform where we get the foot full traffic into our um, Redshift database. Spend map drop the file into an S3 bucket where we can pick it up. The um, vacancy order is done on a app on the, on the phone, a Connect app, and that's brought into an MS, MS SQL database and uploaded. We then produce the report, which the, the team can then run through work out what their insights are, and then they write up a blurb and they put it into an Excel spreadsheet in SharePoint, which then comes into another Power um, BI to create the infographic where we can then export the PDF. So as the in infographic is only done quarterly, there's no need for an auto refresh. And we also don't, there's no need to have the blurb uploaded into the data stack, and we can just do it once a quarter um, myself and someone from the team. So here we have the semantic model. It's basically four fact tables and some dimensions. So we, we don't actually have some um, quantitative benefits at the moment because we've only just done the quarter three snapshot. 
um, and that we're in the process of sending out to the councils and the business community. Um, but we're seeing it as an invaluable tool for small businesses um, to plan, to get them more data literate and to help them make some um, data driven decisions. And we see it as a way to increase economic activity in our re retail precincts and to attract businesses. For example, if we give this to estate agents, they've got information to give to um, prospective businesses. So we created an interactive report, which was basically a page on each data type. So here we have the footfall page. They wanted trends, um, how well the precincts were doing, um, which day of the week is the busiest, which time of day is the busiest. So we gave them the five busiest days and the five busiest hours in whatever time frame they choose. Um, and then, so if they choose, South Yarra. It just slices and dices by that so they can go in and have a closer look. We get two spend um, files. We get one that's daily. So for the daily file, they can see all hours, nighttime hours, which is 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., non work hours as weekends and public holidays, as well as work hours. And they can look at the resident local spend and the visitor local spend or the total local spend. And with the daily file, um, if there's, they anonymise the data by if there's five transactions or less, it, it's, it's made to be zero. So if you actually add up the daily file and compare it to the monthly file, the monthly file has a, is slightly higher than the daily file because it's more anonymized at the monthly level. So the monthly file is basically the same. Here they, they don't have nighttime hours, they only have non-work, work hours and all hours. But now it gets split up more um, into more different types of spend. So they can look at escape spend and ex, um, internal spend and what have you. Then we have the vacancies, um, so it just gives a snapshot how many um, businesses were surveyed and what the vacancy rate is, new businesses, relit businesses, closed businesses. One of the problems we do have is um, the data is input um, by somebody who walks the streets and sees that a business has changed. If they correct a spelling mistake or something, our system isn't quite um, experienced enough to know that a slight spelling change is still the same business. So sometimes they are relit businesses is slightly overreported. But I guess the main um, purpose of this is actually the, the vacancy rate. So then I set up the infographics. So I just set up a, a page at the start where they can select their quarter and then the quarters that they want to um, compare against. And then I have a page for each um, precinct. And then they can check the details and export um, to PDF. I just bring this one up. So the blurb comes from, from the Excel spreadsheet in SharePoint, but everything else is coming from the data stack. This visual here I actually did in Deneb because um, I couldn't work out if it could be possible from native Power BI visuals. Yeah. So that's it. And I probably talked really, really fast. I'm sorry about that. Any questions? I see there's a so hand. Yeah, if there's any questions, um, I'm going to raise your hand. You hopefully you go to the top of the list. We can just drop it in the chat. Um, what was there? Was there any? I think the, the end product looks fantastic. I mean, what was the the feedback from the organisation? I mean, especially you know, essentially you're automating most of this process now. Was there was there any pushback? Did they did they like it? Yeah, I think um, it's yeah, it's been fairly positive so far. 
Um, as I say, it's only early days. We were kind of racing to get this out. Um, I'm sure the councillors will have a lot to say. Excellent. Um, okay, Jason, you've got a question. Hi, that was uh, that was excellent. Um, the I was just um, with the ABN. Can you use the ABN instead of the name of the business to make sure that those mismatches don't happen? Um, or the uh, TFN or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, part part, mm. part of the problem with that is uh, whether or not the company is trading because I can have the ABN, but. You know, if, if it was myself, I'm a, I'd be a sole trader, so it would be in my legal name, but I might be trading as, you know, Tory's exotic gifts or something like that. Yeah. Um, we, and yeah the, um, we are looking at bringing in ABR. Oh, we are looking at bringing in oh. ABR data, but it was, you know, trying yeah. to Stage contain two. it. <laughs> Stage two. Yeah. yeah, it's always a division of effort, isn't it? Like, you know, if it's less than 1% of responses, then, yeah, you know, you can live with it. Whereas, you know, if it, it is showing a, you know, a larger magnitude, then, yeah, you can you can put it down as an issue and then address it later. Um, I was just wondering about that generation of the info infographic that looked awesome. Was that paginated reports? No. Um, I, I don't really know enough about paginated reports. To me, it seemed to be more like doing invoices and tables and stuff. So I'd be interested to see... Um, the presentation at the next community of practice about they how they were doing it but basically it's just a standard power bi um report um shaped like a a4 page oh excellent that looked really good um that, that you've done great in that time frame and the, in the context you had to deal with so yeah it looks really good thank you thank you uh we have a question from anna she missed what the visual was used for the text on the blurb. On the blurb, yeah. I think that's just blurb. a table. Um, I don't know now with the new card whether or not, because when I originally created this, you know, cards centred everything, um, so I couldn't like let mm. justify it. So now that they've got the new card, I might be actually be able to put it into the into the new card. But at the moment, that's just a table with the heading hidden. Um, any other questions, feel free to raise your hand. I'm not seeing any in the chat. Um, Harry would like to know, how are vacancies captured? Okay, so um, basically the, the auditors have, um, we use something called Connect, where they they build a little app and it lists all the properties that we're expecting to have in the vacancy. They walk the street and they go, oh, okay, this shop's empty. They mark the property as being empty. They go to the next one. Um, it's, it's changed since the last audit, so they'll update the details. They go, and they basically just inspect each one. And then we bring that in and basically we just look at was there a business name last time and now it's vacant, so therefore it's a new vacancy? Was it vacant last time and it's still vacant this time? And then we count it as still vacant. Excellent. Um, Mandy would like to know, what, how are you doing the PDF export? Oh, very simple. Um, you just go and um, export to PDF. We, um, so, so we can do one page at a time or all the pages. Um, we don't have Power BI um, premium capacity, so we can't um, set up a Power Automate to do it. So it is manual for us. Um, Brendan would like to know, how long did the project take? Oh, <laughs> it's quite a while, I think. Um, yeah, at least six months. Um, we had a bit of toing and froing getting the data from SpendMap because 
their normal procedure is people go onto their platform and download an Excel spreadsheet. We wanted to remove as much manual processing as possible because um, then you have a problem that people save it with the wrong name or they fiddle with the file or whatever like that. So um, there was a bit of toing and froing um, with them because they didn't want, they don't have an API, they didn't want us going into their system. Our IT security people didn't want them coming into our system. So it took a while to, the, and we're both in Amazon. So um, we ended up with, they drop it into an S3 bucket and we pick it up from that S3 bucket. Did you have to create an IAM authentication for them to access your bucket in AWS? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, so yeah, they set up um, accounts and what have you. Right, and they do it manually. They just keep dropping it in there. I'm yeah, yeah. Right. They yeah they drop it in. I think the day after they sort of finalize the data. Okay, one day late. That sounds good. Thank you. But we have an automatic process that checks the S3 bucket every day, and if the file's there, then we process it. Right, you set up your crawlers. Got it. Thank you so much, Tori. Okay, okay. One one last question. Uh, John would like to know what data volumes are you dealing with? Um, well, the, the spend data goes all the way back to January the 1st, um, 2019. So you know, there's a record for every day and record for every month and all the different. So I, I don't actually have the actual figures. Um, with the foot traffic, we're getting the data's every 15 minute increments. Um, I'm only pulling in a year's worth of that data so we can compare um, with last year. Um, and then the, va the vacancy data is very, very small because there's only about 2,000 rows per per vacancy, so that's not very big at all. So, well, thank you, Tori. It's fa fascinating, really good to see, you know, end-to-end -end project at end and also that supporting the PDF, a little bit different, so as an another use case to add to your tool belt. So thanks, Tori, I really appreciate that. Well, I hadn't heard of infographics and then um, Greg hmm. Nash um, showcased it at the Power BI Summer and I thought, oh, well, you know, we can do that. So, so yeah, so it's probably been going since about then. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Tori. Uh, next up, we've got Raymond. So Raymond's um, stepped up. So we're, we're just going to do a little bit of an informal Q&A. Um, if you don't know Raymond, you should follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, a bit of a Power BI guru. He's uh, running the Power BI shop over at City of Bend. I'll let him introduce himself, but I think there'll be a lot of learnings if you're looking at, you know, how do we move from individuals doing Power BI to scaling it to an organization, you know, with governance and control running a Power BI platform. So um, I will stop sharing. And welcome. Thank, thanks, Raymond. Yeah, thanks, Warren. It's uh, great to be here. Excellent. All right. Did you want to just quickly do an intro and just a bit of a background for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Warren said, I, I'm a senior program manager with the city of Bend. That's in uh, the United States here in Oregon is where I'm at, kind of right almost dead center in the middle of Oregon. Um, where I live is kind of high desert, so um, uh, not the not pretty trees and and lots of green stuff. It's mostly desert out here and and sand. So um, let's see. The city of Bend. We've got about 750 employees, um, and I work for a department within the city called the Office of Performance Management. Um, I've been with OPM since February of 2018. I started with the city back in 2014, November 2014. Um, so about nine years or so with the city now. Um, I've been doing the uh, the data analytics thing since about 2010. So since well before Power BI desktop was a thing, uh, back then it was SQL Server um, analysis services. Uh, we did a lot of, when Power Pivot first came along, did a lot of Power Pivot and um, also SQL reporting services. So those SSRS reports, uh, super fun stuff there. Um, and, and a lot of it with uh, Visual Studio, which is one of my least favorite tools to use. Um, so it was pretty super happy to, to get moved on to Power BI desktop and uh, and haven't really looked back much unless I absolutely have two cents. Um, let's see, OPM. Uh, so we're, 20, we're 18 people now. Um, when we started in 2018, there were four of us. 
so we've we've uh, grown as a department quite a bit. Um, I personally um, manage the RAD team. That's the reporting and database team. And so there are three of us there. Um, one's the database administrator for all the, the databases in the city. Another is the uh, lead report developer. And then I also do some report development, but also lots of other bits and pieces, uh, everything from governance, training, outreach, et cetera, just all the other things that uh, that, that we kind of put in to make Power BI and, and reporting in general sort of successful here at the city. Um, let's see, we've got four other or three other, sorry, three other divisions within the Office of Performance Management. So one of those is GIS, that's Geographic Information System, so data on maps. Um, so we've got those guys in uh, Enterprise Asset Development or a uh, data division. Um, so EADD, those guys do basically keep track of all the city's assets, and that's everything from like water mains and sewer sewer lines to um, manhole covers to fire hydrants, things like that. So all the city's assets that are somewhere around the city, uh, those guys take care of, of that. Um, and then we've got a new, sort of a newer piece of the team, and that's our Spark team, that's continuous improvement. Um, and now we kind of fold in the work that they do into a lot of the work that the other teams do. Um, I'm actually working in part of a Spark project right now that's uh, all about fire uh, fire lines and uh, and the fees that we collect for fire lines that go into uh, commercial buildings. So that's that's me, and that's uh, that's kind of the team, Warren. Yeah, and so you mentioned. I think you said you started with four, and you're 18 now. Um, yep. How are you going to talk us through, I suppose, how, I suppose, that scale process, like what sparked that move and I suppose what was, how did you measure it or how did you transition from maybe individual report writers to, you know, an environment for Power BI for the whole organization? Yeah, so it all sort of started with, uh, there were those four of us kind of talking about how it should be, right? Like we'd get together for and have coffee and talk about, you know, the problems with the existing system and getting data. Um, and we made a pitch uh, to uh, to management and our community and economic development department. So those are the people that issue permits for building um, licenses. So if you've got a, you know, a business license, et cetera, um, or do code enforcement, those guys were like, yeah, we see the value in this because everybody here in Bend, it's one of the fastest growing small cities, medium sized cities in the US actually. Um, and basically everybody here really cares about development and how long it takes to get their permit approved so they can build the next house or the next subdivision or the next commercial property, right? So um, so those guys were really keen on uh, on helping stand up a data um, team, and they sort of offered to to bring us all together and actually help fund uh, help fund all of our physicians. So um, we started off there. Uh, one of the first projects we had was a, uh, a city council we, we always call it dashboard, but really it was more than that. There was a bunch of Power BI reports, but they were uh, you know, public facing and embedded in our public website, right? So that city council could show constituents exactly um, how they were doing on the, the things that they promised to get elected, right? Um, so right away, we had some really um, important people looking at the, the data we were putting out there. Um, kind of at the same time, we did some internal reporting um, it was SSRS stuff, which was hugely painful, but um, but we got there, and uh, and so that was a, a budget budget to actuals report that uh, that got built, right? So these two big reports, uh, lots and lots of eyes on them, um, and that kind of got us going, right? And so from there, they were like, you know, <laughs> this is great. What if we gave you another person? What could you do with that? And it just sort of snowballed after that. Um, more people. Uh, wanted more data. And then we had this sort of this nice confluence of events where um, we were replacing the permitting system. So the enterprise system we use to issue permits and licenses and all that. Um, and that system, uh, again, that's the community development department. They had lots of um, of people already used to using all the reporting that was ba uh, baked into the old system. So we had dozens and dozens of reports to build there um, in very limited capacity. And, um, and then we got a new uh, chief innovation officer. Uh, she uh, is also a, a data 
enthusiast. Uh, she was a former GIS uh, person uh, at a previous job, and so she's very keen on data. And then just everything kind of gelled together just right. So, so we did some very key projects that got a lot of uh, interest from people high up in the organization. We also did a lot of smaller projects that were uh, really important to the people that use the system, and and those were also for a department that that you know is keenly interested in how quickly what their workload is and how quickly they can get through that workload and sharing that with the the builders here in the city. Um, so all those things kind of came together, and uh, the next thing you know, we we got, we you know just kept adding people, and uh, like I said, now we're up to eighteen. So. And and so you've added, I suppose, a lot of people. Um, I assume now you you know you've got a lot of data, a lot of reports. Um, you want to talk us through maybe the the governance side of things, like how do, how do you manage all of this um, at a high level? I suppose go governing different reports, different semantic models. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, we started uh, back in 2018, 2017, 2018, we stood up a Power BI report server. Um, so that's the on-prem way that you can publish a Power BI report and then let basically anybody use it uh, via web browser, right? Um, we already had the licensing for it because we had SQL Server uh, Enterprise. So that gave us the licensing, um, which made it very easy to get started with Power BI. Um, as we developed those dozens and dozens of reports for the uh, for the new permitting system, uh, it became apparent very quickly just within our small team at the time uh, that if we weren't careful, we could overwhelm the server with refresh requests, right? So this, this server was not just doing Power BI, it also uh, was SQL analysis services. So powering things like that budget to actuals report that I talked about and a few other data models. Um, so, so we we realized very quickly because we got a few reports up there and they were basically killing the report server. Uh, it, it would get to a point where um, you know nothing else would refresh. We were having lots and lots of failures. Um, so very quickly we decided, hey, uh, things have to go through us before they get published, right? So that's the, one of the first things that we did. We implemented this um, sort of a, a managed self service, right? You can go build your own report, then you ship it to us. We take a look at it, make sure that um, you're following best practices. You know, you're not getting too much data in there. Your data model looks OK, those sorts of things um, before it ever gets published. Right. Um, we also started implementing some other pieces. Right. So one of the first thing we did, we had lots of reports to build, um, short time to get there. And so um, a lot of those reports were built off of the production system, which is bad, 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 right? You don't want to do that. And uh, it, it definitely reared its head uh, pretty quickly. So we, um, our, our database admin figured out a way to get us a near real-time copy of the production system. So we've got that on a couple of our key um, enterprise systems now, and those live uh, on a server that's dedicated to just reporting, right? And so uh, those databases, the, the complete copy basically gets updated once every half hour or so. Um, and for reporting purposes, for the most part, that works with the exception of, you know, a very few reports that just absolutely must be, you know, uh, up to date. So we've done some things like that, right? So no more reporting off of production systems, centralizing to a data mart uh, for all reporting, and then having copies of databases um, specifically for reporting purposes. Um, reports that aren't developed by our, by our team go through, uh, basically you submit a ticket, attach the, the report, and then we help, you know, we work with you to make sure it, it meets standards and gets published. We also, um, once we got Power BI Premium, um, we we kind of locked that down in terms of uh, who gets to create workspaces. That's basically us, and we create certain types of workspaces. We have enterprise workspaces versus department or group level workspaces, right? And so, um, and then a whole basically, well, a whole a whole set of rules around who gets to publish to what, right? And and for the most part, if it's enterprise, if it's something that's going to cross department lines or or interact with a um, uh, an enterprise system, then we're the ones that do the publishing. Um, public facing reports, same thing. We do that uh, so that we keep track of uh, what's out there um, and make sure that stuff that gets published 
should be published, right? That we're not over sharing stuff that shouldn't be shared up there, right? Um, another one of the things that, uh, that we built in pretty quickly was a way to track uh, report usage. Um, and so we've got two different systems now. We've got Power BI Premium and the report server. So I'm tracking report usage from each one. Um, and if a report's not getting updated or not getting used within you know a, a year or so, then we we actually contact the people who own the report and hey, do you still need this thing, right? And so we have a, a robust system set up that uh, gets rid of old reports and retires those things. So um, kind of a lot going on there. Uh, and I know I'm forgetting some stuff, but uh, hopefully that gives you some some idea of some of the things we. Yeah. And so you mentioned report users. So obviously, people in your team are building reports, and you've got people external to your team building reports. Um, you know, have you gone down this kind of self service path, or do you allow them to connect to their own data? Um, you know, talk us through that. Yep, we uh, we absolutely do that. Again, it's this sort of managed self service. If, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Matthew Roche and Melissa Coates. Uh, they developed sort of a Power BI best practices and you know implementing all that. And so they, there's a few different ways to do it where um, it's just sort of wild wild west, or there's something in the middle where it's sort of managed, uh, but we let them do it, or just all us and we're kind of right in the middle. Um, and so we've got folks like over on the budget team who they they know their data very well. Um, and so they have access to a copy of the database that has all of our budget data in it, right? And so they create their own reports. They do get to publish to their their uh, work group workspace, but we still work with them to set up the refreshes to make sure that uh, we're using service accounts, for instance, that the permissions are set up correctly and that when the refreshes are set up, um, that they are done at the right time because we have to schedule that based on all the other jobs and things that are going on in the in the organization right uh, so lots of stuff going on like that and budgets one one example but a few other groups are like that as well it really depends on uh basically how proficient the the power bi uh developer is out in the department um and it, we kind of struggle with that um you know we've done lots of trainings since we got started we've done uh, eight trainings so far and um since uh since 2017 so usually one and when I talk about training, it's it's having a uh, instructor come in and do a two to three day training um, on Power BI. And we we found particularly on the finance side of things that people get trained up in Power BI and then they'll go get another job and be the, the manager of some other uh, local organization. And so um, so a lot of our higher level Power BI folks out in the departments end up moving on, which is great, you know, but uh, but but we do have a few that are out there that um, we work with to make sure their reports get published. So it is sort of this managed self-service thing. Some of them get to use the data sets, et cetera. And again, that that just well, semantic models now, right? Um, but that's all about the level of the uh, you're right, the the level of the the person uh, that we're working with. So it's sort of a case by case basis. Yeah, excellent. I realize I'm hogging the questions and they're coming through in the chat, so apologies. Um, Richard, I'll hand over to you if you want to ask your question. Thank you. Um, I've got a question around uh, Fabric and potentially Direct Lake. So kind of in a similar vote to you, but very early on the journey um, in terms of a role. Um, Obviously, you're talking about how scheduling your data set refreshes or semantic model refreshes um, is really important. Um, I'm just wondering, kind of, the fabric coming along and the ability to you know, connect to Direct Lake, kind of spending that compute on live streaming of stuff or live um, delivering of insights rather than setting up schedule refreshes to run every five minutes or whatever. Um, just wondering what's your thoughts or game plan in, in terms of moving forward in terms of that space? Yeah, so that is a, it's a very good question. And um, we have uh, within our department, we have, you know, department level goals and then our team level goals. Um, and so one of the goals we have for the RAD team is to, to determine a, a sort of a march, a plan to move forward with fabric. Um, I've basically done nearly every Microsoft Learn course out there on Fabric so far, um, along with just about every single step-by-step um, -step walkthrough of the different features that, that I can get my hands on. Um, and so, so far, 
Um, and well, actually, up until about last week when I heard about mirroring, <laughs> um, you know, getting the, the data up into one lake, uh, however you're getting it there, still requires because all of our data is on site, right? It's all on SQL servers on prem. So at some point, we still have to, I mean, it's essentially a refresh, right? You still got to get the data from on prem to up there. So up until mirroring, um, I wasn't seeing a whole lot of benefit and had done a fair amount of, of uh, personal testing, working with Microsoft to see what the differences were in terms of, uh, you know, pushing it up into one lake and then uh, creating a data model or a semantic model now from uh, from a data set there and and then a report based on that versus just a straight up um, a standard report. Not seeing a lot of uh, differences. In fact, the standard reports typically working better. <laughs> Uh, in my experience, mirroring kind of is going to change all that, right? Because if I don't have to refresh, if it's just keeping the data up to date, that's a whole other thing. And it looks like next year, maybe um, winter, March timeframe is when they're talking about having that live for SQL Server. Uh, that that's going to be it's going to totally shift everything, right? Um, and so at that point, yeah, we're going to be re rethinking a lot, right? We're we've got this on-prem data mart. Um, I could foresee taking that data mart and just mirroring it up into um, one lake and then running the reports from there. Uh, it'd be a huge shift, but uh, kind of I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> um, a lot of the first promises that uh, that I saw, they, they just didn't quite pan out in my testing. Um, and I've been working with, my, with Microsoft. I'll be the first to say I don't know everything about it. I've done a whole lot, and I'm sure that the Microsoft folks would, uh, would correct me on some of the stuff out there. Um, but uh, but basically, I'll, I'll believe when I see. I am mirrorings. There's a lot of promise there for me, so I'm I'm hopeful that uh, that that solves that getting the data from on-prem into into the cloud. One of the things that we run into and why we have to keep our data on-prem is that GIS, right? Like uh, the data mart also serves not it, it serves as the the source for not just our Power BI and paginated reports. It's also the source state of a lot of um, GIS data. So that GIS data has to be reachable on-prem. And so it, it creates some um, complications, I guess, uh, in what we can do, right? We can't just go straight to having the data mark only in the cloud because then GIS can't talk to it. Okay, great. Yeah, I suppose um, our space is a bit different in that most of our data is cloud, including our GIS stuff. I haven't dived into it much yet, but um, yeah, so the, the opportunities for us might be a bit greater the new with um, the, the heavy reliance on prem stuff. Thank you. Awesome. And then got a question from John. What do you use to extract your Power BI online report usage metrics? Ah, I've got a, a big long PowerShell. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, it's not that big, but uh, but yeah, it's. This is one one of my frustrations from the get go. Like Power BI can't talk to its own metrics to just natively pull that stuff out. <laughs> I wish it could, but uh, alas, it cannot. And so I've got a PowerShell script that goes and grabs that stuff once a week, um, and then uh, a SQL uh, services integration job that grabs it from a file and shoves it into a SQL Server database, and uh, I go from there. Excellent. Um... Another question I wanted to ask is, uh, do you have an internal user group or anything like that that you that you own? Yeah, absolutely. So the user group's been going since our first um, training, which was back in 2017 or so. Um, basically, I realized we all went and got this training and uh, we needed a way to share what we'd learned. By the way, I just noticed your Voltron back there. Uh, I, I love the Voltron. I, I watched the whole series with my kiddo. It's a big deal. So <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, back to the user group, though. Um, so we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, I got some stats here because uh, I knew you were going to ask about this. I wanted to see if I could run through and find. Uh, so lots of, lots of, oh, man. I had the stats and they're buried in a bunch of text. Anyway, um, well over 100, uh, 100 user group sessions and uh, 60 some odd unique uh, presenters. And then most of those are uh, internal, but we've also had folks from uh, other organizations, other government organizations uh, present as well. Um, 
and yeah, usually it's every other week or so, uh, every other month or so. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty short sort of presentations. Actually, this is this uh, this is a way for me to test out a a new presentation style here. Is this uh, Q and A format? So. No, it's been good. I, I feel like we need more time though to be able to to, to pick your brain. So I think a bit of feedback. Yeah, we're allowing a bit more time for a Q&A. And especially it's really good. We've got lots of questions in here. Um, but just to, I suppose, to respect time, I might have to kick that in. I suppose if you do have any questions, Raymond is coming back. So if you want to hold those questions or you can email them to me or something, and then maybe at the start of his session in February, um, I can pre-send them to him and we can we can move through them a little bit faster. So maybe we'll do it. If you've got any other questions for Raymond, please um, shoot me an email. Um, Raymond's definitely a wealth of information, especially if you want to look at, you know, how do we govern this thing? How do we scale this thing um, as as it's getting bigger? Um, so if you do have any other questions, please shoot them to me and we will we'll do them at the start of next session. Um, my last session is, is very quick. So thanks. Thanks, Raymond. Really appreciate your time. Hopefully it's not too late for you over there. Um, I don't know, we got you working after hours. Um, so thank you, thank you once again. Um, I'll share my screen. My session is, is barely two minutes. I just wanted to talk about uh, in terms of comparison reports. So um, Birgit, who's from Banyol, approached me um, last week, and she's, for those of you in Victoria, you might have heard of the LGPRF. Um, so they're an organisation that um, give data that so all the corporate reporting teams have to provide data to the LG PRF. They consume the data, they send it back to you in this massive Excel spreadsheet. And she said, has any other organization you know of, have they consumed this data into Power BI? I don't want to do the whole thing from scratch, right? Has anyone else built a Power BI report for this? And and if you know me, you know, collaboration is one of the things on my heart that I wish we could um collaborate a little bit more. Um, and I can see Clara's mentioning that she does. So I feel like, you know, LGPRF, open data, there's a lot of opportunities where we could possibly have a Power BI report that we could share amongst each other in GitHub. People can make improvements instead of us all trying to do exactly the same thing. And I can see a few people mentioning, so everyone in corporate reporting would need to do this to analyze this data. So I've, I have mocked up something, um, but obviously if this is something we can collaborate on, we could either share a Power BI Excel file, um, if I brought it up here. So, um, you know, I've already put this data in, you know, in OneDrive, um, and here's all the LGA Pro for 22, 23, and here's all the data here. Um, so I've, I've put that in there, and I've not only put that in there, I've put other data in there as well, um, if I can turn on the filter. Um, so I've got AOD stats, FIDU, Vic Roads, Public Health Survey, um, and I just thought it'd be great if we could, you know, have an Excel spreadsheet. I know Excel's not supposed to be a source of data, but if we had some kind of open source where we could have enough columns to, you know, be able to filter the data and have one Power BI report instead of everyone building their own Power BI reports, um, and, we, and then you could spend a bit more time analyzing the report. So here's an example I've mocked up, and I'm happy to to work with other people if we want to have a a working group of people. But here, you know, you can you can look through um, if I want to look at you know animal management prosecutions or things like that. Um, have a look at that data, find a way we can export it. You can export it to PDF. Um, so that's just my thought um, and I'll just tack it on at the end. Maybe we can discuss it a little bit later, but I suppose if you're keen on this, shoot me an email. Um, I don't know how this would work, but I would love for us to, you know, as government organizations be able to collaborate because we've got people from Vic Roads here. We've got people from other state departments, local government. Um, if there's some way we could share this open data, have a GitHub, you can have your own versions of the Power BI report. We can push it back and have a main version as people improve it um, and collaborate together. I think that'd be something awesome for us to, to build as a community. So I'll, I'll leave that there, but do reach out if you've built something already, if you're happy to collaborate and share, or you just want to be involved. Um, please let me know. I'd love to be able to, you know, us as a group to be able to build something. It doesn't have to just be Victoria. We can build it out for all of Australia, um, New Zealand, if you're interested. Uh, but obviously the data is going to be specific to where it is. So that was just my kind of throwaway at the end of the session. Um, fingers crossed we can we can get some collaboration working together as a group. So really keen to do that. I know Birgit is keen to do that from Banyol. Um, so please send me an email if you want to collaborate on that. We'll, we'll try to work something out. 
Um, but that is us for the end of the session. Again, um, I still really want to try to get a Power BI session up and running before the end of the year. So if you're interested in training, please do reach out to me. If you're interested in how, you know, rolling out Power BI, user groups, all that type of stuff, please do reach out. But once again, thank you so much. Sorry we've gone slightly over time, but appreciate you coming along. I will see you again in February. And Merry Christmas to you all. I hope you have a good break. So thanks, everyone. Stick on the line if you've got any other questions. But thanks for attending. I'll see you in February.